welcome everyone. I imagine people are going to continue to uh, hop in here. My name is Debbie Flegel. I'm a program manager and field coordinator for Trees Forever. Um, we are happy to have Trisha Bethke with us today. She's going to uh, present on, give us a tree health update. Lots of information coming your way today. Um, in the background is my colleague, Jeff Jensen, and he will be helping to moderate questions. So without any further ado, I would like to introduce Trisha. She is the Illinois Forest Pest Outreach Coordinator. Her position is funded through a cooperative grant with the USDA APHIS and the Morton Arboretum. Trisha's responsibilities include statewide training of key stakeholders on, on the USDA APHIS Hungry Pest Program, forest pest identification, high-risk pathways, regulations and quarantines, and reporting protocols. So with that, I'm going to turn off my screen and turn it over to Tricia. Excellent. Thank you, Debbie. It is a pleasure to be here. I'm actually going to turn off my webcam because you don't need me to see me talking with my hands, but I will get back on at the end of the presentation. And to be honest with you, I really look forward to uh, the next time we gather being in person. So I hope everybody is well. If you have any questions, please put them in the questions box because I want to be able to answer them. I've got some really hot, just off the press uh, forest pest information, a quick update for you. So we've got that. So without further ado, I am just going to hide my webcam and I can see, good, I am, uh, this is a picture of me, and the next time we get together, you're gonna have your own spotted lanternfly headband. But as Debbie mentioned, I am the Forest Pest Outreach Coordinator. My program is funded through the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and this is just a snapshot. On an annual basis, we typically have about 60 in-person forest pest trainings all throughout the state. So if you are at all interested in receiving any education or outreach material, please feel free to contact me. Um, you know, even during COVID, we are able to uh, still connect with people and still keep up our training and education on forest pests. So last year, and actually part of this year, is the International Year of Plant Health. So the U.S. Department of Agriculture is really, truly interested in making sure that our food supply stays secure. And they will do whatever it is they can to protect it from any forest pests or insects or diseases. And, you know, sadly enough, right now, an, an annual estimate is about $120 billion um, to manage our invasive plants and pests in the United States. And I think that that number actually is quite low. I think this is an old number that was put together about four or five years ago. It's super tough to get a handle on how much it actually costs us to manage invasive pests in our uh, urban and our rural areas. But I think it's a staggering amount, and I often think, you know what, what would that look like if we had that $120 billion to invest in our local communities? So oftentimes people ask me, like, how do these pests get moved around? Well, what you're seeing on your upper left-hand side is a shipping yard in California. Remember the stories about how everything was backed up and these cargo ships were out on the ocean? Well, when they come in and they get checked in and they're about to get inspected, they sit there and they wait and they wait and they wait. And oftentimes that's how these pests get moved from one country into the United States, whether it's on the West Coast, the East Coast or Southern, or even, you know, to be honest with you in Northeast Illinois, I mean, Northeast part of the country. Um, less than 1% of any of the solid wood packaging material, which you see over on your right hand side, gets inspected. So oftentimes our pests, Asian longhorn beetle came in through wood, solid wood packaging material that hadn't gone through a phytosanitation process. So that larva was in there, gets moved to a different area. It doesn't get noticed and all of a sudden that larva hatches and, and all of a sudden finds its perfect host. And there you go, that's how these pests get established. Um, the other main human activity, and you'll see this image before, is firewood. 
if there is one thing that you can take away from this presentation, it is not to move firewood. Firewood is the number one main pathway of distribu distributing pests and pathogens around the country. What we need to do is really truly buy local and burn local. This is a really good kind of image to show you the complexities that we have when we're try trying to manage our forest pests. So you've got all these different shipping routes. And not only do you have pests coming from Australia, Africa, South America, once they get here and they get established, we have to start to do some real investigative work to figure out where they were in their native range, what was keeping them in check, and why don't we have that same type of predator population here in the United States. Spotted lanternfly is a really cool example because in Asia, spotted lanternfly is on, I think, a lot of sycamore, and what keeps them in check is praying mantis. And yet you think, well, we certainly have praying mantis here in the United States, but maybe not quite to the level that it should in order to keep populations in, in check. So it's a, an interesting example. I always say this is my favorite slide. You wanna make sure that we are, are aware of what happens when we get a pest establishment. So my job is to keep everybody in the green. So over on the lower left-hand corner, I want the least amount of area, the least amount of time, and the least amount of costs associated with it. If you go right into that middle, you see what says where public awareness typically begins. If I had to put a time on that, that's generally five to seven years. And I don't really like using all of these average times because to be honest with you, you kind of think about what, whether or not it's really valid. Sure enough, last year, South Carolina Asian longhorn beetle was found and they went back and they started to look at that population and they can really determine that that pest and those pests, all of the Asian longhorn beetles, that population's actually been there for about seven years. So these numbers are really solid. So what we're trying to do is make sure that people get out and do early detection. Early detection is our best defense. In Illinois, the great state of Illinois, we've got a number of high-risk pathways, over 36,000 miles of rails. We've got over 9,000 miles of railroad tracks. Who knew there were 119 airports for public use? And we've got sawmills and marinas. So where you're seeing everything lit up in red, those are those real high risk pathways. That, that means that there's a greater likelihood like down around St. Louis, the central part of Illinois, and then up in the northeastern part of the state, that there is the likelihood of, of an introduction. And what we're thinking about is looking at different models to say if there's something out on the east coast, where is it going to come into the state via transportation, whether it's rail or whether it's by trucking, and then really focus our efforts on these areas. So it's important to start to look at this research and try to figure out how we can best be proactive and monitor for potential pest threats. Impacts of weather, I'm going to talk about this today because, you know, we've got weather, 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 weather. Um, this, is, this is a game changer this season, so flooding is just as damaging as drought. And oftentimes in our trees, they present the same way, so early dieback. You've got browning of the leaves, you've got early leaf drop, you've got necrosis on the leaves, sort of the changing of the color, if you will, of those leaves. In, if we look back historically, we're seeing that there's a pattern that we've got increased springtime precipitation. So looking from, I don't know, about 1995, 19, you know, year 2000, you're starting to see this increase, but as we know, not this year. So where we have wetter springs, we have increased nighttime humidity, we've got increased warmer temperatures, you've got more likely of a pathogen. When you've got drought conditions, like we are having up in the Northern Illinois, we've got these droughty conditions. Couple, think back to the end of last summer. Last summer, we were in a drought. And so you've got now kind of two big times in a tree's life where they are deficient um, in getting the nutrients and the water that they need. 
So we're seeing warmer springs. Certainly we're seeing this um, continue, this pattern continue. But knowing these patterns and knowing kind of what's going on is really helpful when you're trying to identify what potentially could be wrong with the trees that you have in and around your community. I always say this is a tough life for a tree. Say you've got, you know, you planted that tree improperly and then you've got a drought. Well, then all of a sudden, there's a frost crack over the winter on that tree. So that tree is exposed to potentially a fungus that might be nearby. It isn't necessarily one thing or another. Potentially it's a compounding effect and we're certainly seeing that with oak decline. So you see it's a one-two punch or two-line chestnut borer as well. You've got to have a pathogen, a host, and then in a favorable environment. Over on the upper right hand side, you know, I see this and I look at that tree and I think, first of all, that tree is not planted in the right place. And then you're seeing that fungus down there. And while it may look cool, that to me says that tree is compromised. It's rotting from the inside out. So it's important to be able to look at these trees and understand what's happening, even when you can't see inside of them, that outward um, uh, visualization of that fungus or that pathogen is really important. What does the sick tree look like? Some of these are my pictures because to be honest with you, um, there's been many opportunities lately for me to get out and go to different areas within uh, you know, the, the no central and, and northern part of Illinois uh, to take a look at some of the trees and, and the stress that's associated with it. We're seeing this all over. I believe that this is anthracnose. You've got that, that dying leaf. Um, oftentimes during the spring that leaf uh, starts to emerge and then there's a cold snap and it gets hit and it's wet and cold. Oftentimes that can create anthracnose. So on our oaks and on our maples, we're seeing a lot of these spotty areas where you've got dead and dying leaves. Does that mean that the tree's in trouble? No. If you look at the tree in its entirety and you can see a majority of green leaf area, you're probably just dealing with something like anthracnose and that's a wait and see. Crown dieback, I took this picture um, in a local school. You know, this, anything more than 25, say 30%, you think about that crown right in the center, that main leader where it's just devoid of leaves. You've got a crown dieback or you've got branch dieback um, that are dispersed around the tree. That tree is under stress and it needs to be evaluated by a trained arborist or a tree care company. Any type of early fruit drop, that's a walnut, you're looking at a nutrient deficiency. So making sure that when we do see a fruit drop, if it is not in the same, it, it's, if it's not appropriate in the season, kind of at the end of the season, you need to have that tree evaluated. This epicormic shoots, we see this all the time. I usually put up an ash tree so everybody knows kind of like what that shrubbiness looks like on a dead ash tree. But this is an oak tree. And anytime these trees start to look like a bottle brush where they start to get the leaves and the branches that are super tight to the trunk or to the, any of the branches, that tree is in decline. That tree is trying to throw out as much leaf area as possible, trying to get as much nutrients to throw it down below ground so it can live and then relief the next year. So it's really important to start looking at the fine twig growth patterns as well as that leaf arrangement. Love a woodpecker. They're the ones that always tell me where I should put my binoculars. So you got a bunch of woodpeckers that are out, you know, during the dormant season and they're really drilling into one area of the tree. Make a note of it. Go get back and make sure that you take a look at it and see what's going on. Could just be our native insects, but oftentimes, you know, it, if they're congregating in one area, it could be a potential uh, area where there's an infestation. I think this is really important, host specific or the environment. So over on the left hand side, you're seeing something that is very host specific. So it could be that it could be that, you know, that that tree is just having it could be oak wilt. It could be um, could be herbicide damage over on the right hand side. You know, this honestly looks like a lot of herbicide damage because all of the trees in that area look all similar. 
So they're all got that browning out, that wilting look. So it's important to, when you see a tree that has dieback, it's important to look around, take a look and see if all of the trees in that area all look the same. And if so, are they all the same species? If they are, that means something could be widespread. It could be in the environment. Otherwise, it could just be host specific. Decline over time, we are seeing this with our oak trees, sadly. Um, the picture over on the left was taken about two years ago, and you're starting to see that, that brushiness on that, the trunk or the bowl of that tree. You're starting to see a really thin canopy on the top, very, very sparse, and look around at that picture. It is during the summer. And then sadly, a year later, and that tree is just checked out. It's on its way out. So, Trees can give us telltale signs. We just need to stop and kind of recognize them and we need to monitor them regularly. Uh, I'm just gonna start moving through some of these uh, images that we've seen. I have um, took this picture, this is a red bud. This red bud should be a beautiful dark green and it is not. It is uh, actually a really yellow green. It is nutrient deficient. There was a lot of water sitting there and it didn't really, uh, a lot of soil compaction as well. So we think that there is a nutrient deficiency going on. Over on the right-hand side, manganese with our pin oaks is a, what we would consider to be a fairly typical uh, leaf color presentation during the growing season for this species. Planting the right tree at the right location is so very important. In Northern Illinois, pin oaks are not happy. We just don't have the soil chemistry to support what this tree needs. Uh, canker is turning out to be a very, very big issue, uh, certainly on some of our hawthorns, uh, on our crab apples as well, and then even some of our maples. So cankers are those long splits that you see in that trunk. Some trees naturally have kind of like, you know, craggy, curly, you know, bark or whatever, but those that typically aren't uh, associated with having that uh, furrowed bark, if you start to see these long cracks and then over on the right hand side, you're starting to see how there is twig dieback. What happens is the canker, when it opens up the bark, it cracks, that pathogen can come in. And the tree desperately tries to oh, oh, just heal it over. And sometimes it's successful and sometimes it's not. Our honey locusts are very, very good at compartmentalizing uh, pathogens within its trunk, but other trees not so much. I'm seeing a lot of oak anthracnose this year. I just really want to point it out. Oak anthracnose has got kind of a, um, kind of just like a, not really of a uniform, but it's just a light browning color. And it's kind of splotchy and it looks just kind of like it's a little bit dried. Um, repeat defoliation could cause a stress. So when these trees get stressed, they send out this kind of uh, pheromone, if you will, that is an attractant to other insects. So it's important to, to watch it. Not really worried about it over time, I think it would have to be a repeated uh, kind of like a five to 10 year cycle of anthracnose in order for it to really start to weaken some of our oak trees. Our sycamore trees are actually quite adapted to leafing out and then getting hit with a cold snap, getting anthracnose and then re-leafing in the summer. Anthracnose on maple, I think it's really important to take a look at that. We are seeing some anthracnose on our maple. It is that dark discoloration right in the middle of the vein. So just trying to point out to you some things that are going on where you see anthracnose on one leaf in that picture, the rest of them are green and healthy. So that's a sign to me. Hey, something to keep aware of, maybe that was the first leaf to actually uh, emerge when there was bud break. So not sure, but that would be my guess. Leaf scorch versus bacterial leaf scorch. I mentioned to you that we're in this really droughty time. So our beech trees and our birch trees, boy, I don't know about you guys. The birch trees just got beat up. They were stressed from last year. They were stressed from this year. I drove around and every birch tree I saw looked like the same. 
very, very sparse leaves on the top part of the twigs, and they look just kind of sickly. And to be honest with you, they haven't really responded that well, so I'd be anxious to see uh, if any of you have had something very similar. So if you're looking at leaf scorch or bacterial leaf scorch, and bacterial leaf scorch is a whole different disease uh, complex. And the biggest difference between leaf scorch on the left and bacterial leaf scorch on the right is this yellow halo effect. So you're starting to see where you've got the browning of the disease and then it starts to fade back. But over on the left-hand side, it's just brown and then it's green. So you see dead tissue and healthy tissue. Here you start to see where the bacteria, the bacterium is actually impacting and killing off those cells. With bacterial leaf scorch, samples need to be sent to a plant clinic so it can be tested and diagnosed and then verified. So big difference between the two of them. Fusarium canker, girdling roots, um, or is this herbicide damage? Uh, I think, you know, Debbie, to be honest with you, herbicide damage presentations probably well worth another webinar. There's a lot to unpack with this. Uh, we are seeing herbicide damage. There is, um, there is a huge request for reporting of any type of suspected herbicide damage. And I think if you actually go out onto the internet and put in Illinois Department of Natural Resources or IDNR and then herbicide damage, you should be able to pull up some information that would educate you on what they are looking for. And if you do have it, how to go ahead and report it. Herbicide damage, the leaves are often cut, they're green, and they're twisted. It's like somebody took that leaf and just, just started to wring it out. Over on the left-hand side, girdling roots can cause a tree to just fail. So think about our maples, and I think I might have a picture. Girdling roots means that those, those roots are just growing around in a big circle. Think, think about like a big merry-go-round. It just keeps going around and around till eventually it starts to choke off all of those fine roots that those trees need. Um, I put this up there because I think we need to be aware and need, we need to be looking at it. We need to figure out what's going on. You suspect herbicide damage. You can take a sample. You can submit it to plant clinic. They can do an analysis and let you know what is going on. Cytophthora canker, we've seen this all the time uh, lately uh, on, on some of our, our spruce trees. You see, typically see where there's white sap. Um, it, it looks like, to be honest with you, it looks like owl, like an owl has been nesting there and it, it's like the whitewash from an owl. Uh, if the needles are fading and they're turning brown, you know, and you start to see that, that white streakiness, Definitely take a picture. You can send it to the plant clinic at mortonarb.org. Uh, take a picture. There is a fungicide, and I'm not going to talk specifically about uh, certain fungicides or certain chemicals because um, I don't have my current um, pesticide license, but I want to make sure that you know where you can go to get more information on it. But definitely, if you've got that neat needle dye back, and it's generally on the lower branches, you know, if it's just here and there on the tree and you can see that white sap, definitely uh, take a, a sample, take a picture, report it, and they will send you a management plan. Diseases of oaks, we're concerned about our, the health of our oak trees. Oak trees in, the, in Illinois are just part of our natural heritage and um, they're old and they're aging out and they're under stress. And we know it is just trying to keep ahead of these stressful cycles and try to help our trees along. So knowing your oaks is really important because if you've got bur oak, you know what, potentially it could be susceptible to bur oak blight. We're starting to see bur oak blight on swamp white oak. Swamp white oak is part bur oak and part uh, white oak. So interesting to see how this disease is moving from one species to another. Anthracnose, white oak is definitely more susceptible. 
Oak leaf blister, I've got a picture of it. I see oak leaf blister on red oak everywhere. It, it's a big season for it because of, of all of the, 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 the spring we had. Oak will, uh, oak will we know is everywhere within the, the state of Illinois, sadly. And I think it's cyclical. Sometimes there's just a lot of oak wilt and then other times doesn't seem like there is as much. I think with these drier temperature or uh, drier uh, fall and a drier spring, I think you'll start to see the, the occurrence of oak wilt decline a little bit. And if we have a repeat next year of a very similar pattern, you might see that oak wilt start to decline. Oak wilt can take down a red oak in one season and with white oak, it can be sort of slow and slowly progressing. And it could be anywhere from five to 12, 15 years for that white oak. It just depends on the level of infection. Bacterial leaf scorch, I think we saw that previously. There are a number of oaks that are affected by bacterial leaf scorch. And then oak decline are, are, both, are prevalent in both red and white oak. Fur oak blight, seeing that V-shaped necrotic wedge. Uh, here we go back. Seeing that V-shaped necrotic wedge, you should start to see it if you do have fur oak blight. Uh, end of July, beginning of August becomes very, very apparent. It usually starts in the lower section, but I took this picture and it started on the upper part of the tree, which means that there's probably other trees around uh, that specific tree that's in that picture that has burrow blight. And the, the pathogen actually overwinters as a spore. So think about like a little pimple or something. When in the springtime, when the temperatures increase and the wind obviously picks up a little bit, those spores open up and then precipitation can help move those spores from one area or one tree to another tree. So oftentimes that's why you see the distribution it can be a little varied. If there is a lot of fallen leaves underneath the tree, that's how that spores, when they open up, that pathogen moves up into the lower part of the tree. Again, that very, very easy to identify necrotic V shape at the tip of the leaf. If you flip it over, it's got like a purplish brown color vein. You're seeing some of it uh, become very, very um, kind of dry and crinkly, but it is very uniform, uh, that V shape. Over the winter, if you know you've got fir oaks and the petioles are still attached to the tree during the winter, if you start to see, if you take, can take one down or if there's one on the ground and you see these raised pustules, that is a positive confirmation of fir oak blight. All you need to do is get a hand lens, take a look at it. If they are raised, they look like a little bit of a pimple um, or a black head or the head of a pin, if you will, um, making sure that uh, you can see it and identify it. Actually, the Forest Service has told us that we don't need to send these into the lab any longer, that they feel confident that if you do see something like this, along with that necrotic V-shaped wedge, that's enough for them to say that tree has burrow blight. There are management studies going on right now. I think Bartlett Tree Care Company is leading the charge on how to uh, treat burrow blights. So we're super excited about that. We've been partnering with them as, as well as many other organizations throughout the state to do some management testing on different uh, herbicide applications. With burrow blight, it takes a really long time. So it is not a one season or two season management. It's usually, it's about a five to 10 year management plan to figure out when is the right time to actually uh, uh, treat these trees in order to arrest or slow the development of this disease down. A Little bit of a look like, if you look at these oak leaves any time during the end of like end of July, August, September, they just look like they're gnarly. It's hard to tell what's going on, but you've got bacterial leaf spot or tubacchia leaf spot over on the left hand side. You've got typhrina, which is a fungal a fungus. Uh, you've got leaf spot, which is that raised puckering, and then you've got anthracnose. Oak leaf blister, take a look at your red oaks. It's just starts to see like a cupping almost. This is a fungus 
nothing to be worried about. It's just something that you should be aware of. It is on the rise this year. We're seeing a lot of it because, um, you know, I think it's just because of the, the tree stress. This Kermi scale, I don't know if anybody has seen this, but this caught my attention. It actually caught my attention because right outside of my window, my neighbor's burrow just looked like somebody went and just shook the tree. And all of these little tiny clusters of leaves just dropped down on the ground. And upon further, see, so look at them. It looks like it's just raining leaves. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. So over on the right hand side, on the, on the, uh, on the left hand side, you start to see that little tiny black scale that it looks like just like a big round ball. That is Kermie's scale. Look down on the lower left, you see it's kind of blackened. Well, what happens is that they lay the eggs and then the petiole just starts to wrap around almost to like protect the scale. And over on the right hand side, you can see it really, really super tiny, but those petioles where they're attached to the branch, they're actually deformed and they're dead. So they're brown and they're dead and they just flop off any kind of wind, rain, and it just flops off. And that's what you see. I have seen it 15, 20 miles apart. Same, same look that was taken in Chicago. The other one was taken 40 miles away. So it's amazing to see the trees respond. So this is a big year for Kermie's scale. This is a big scale year. I know that I believe Don had sent in a photograph of his magnolia. And Don, uh, if you're with us today, I think it's Cottony's soft scale. So we can talk a little bit about it if we have some time at the end of the presentation. But be aware, look very closely at what's going on when you start to see that early leaf drop. Assessing oak decline. So looking at making sure that these trees are planted because if that tree is not planted properly the first time, it is going to have a tough time surviving. So gypsy moth, this is a huge gypsy moth year. I have seen more defoliation of gypsy moth caterpillars than I have in the last seven years. There's a 15 acre parcel and about an acre and a half was absolutely thin canopy, no understory. There were just pockets of these caterpillars everywhere. You could hear them chewing, it was so bad. So you've got a tree that potentially, or there's water changes or it's planted too deeply. And then you've got gypsy moth that comes in or forest tent caterpillar. And then somehow two line chestnut borer comes in and just closes it, or seals the deal, just like takes that tree down. You've got root rot. When you're starting to see that black stringy uh, mass underneath bark, that is a sure sign that that tree is dead. Um, seeing that shrubbiness again over on the lower right hand side, that's two line chestnut borer. I mean, these are the things that we see often and we need to be aware of them in order to help them uh, either get treated or do some cultural like pruning during the non-growing season. Pruning these large oaks is super helpful uh, during the non-growing season. So during the winter, it's really helpful to ha have them prune on any dead wood, open that up, you know, get some air going into these trees so they can at least start to fight off some of these pathogens. Two-line chestnut borer, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I didn't really talk about two-line chestnut borer until last year, at the end of last year. Um, really didn't see a lot of it. I know Wisconsin's got a huge problem with burrow flight and two-line chestnut borer. I think Rainbow Tree Care is really good at, at getting in and, and getting an active and aggressive management plan. But you're seeing that this is a really, you know, very similar borer, if you will, white, it's slender. Um, it goes after not our, our dead and dying trees. It goes after those healthy trees that are under stress. And if I saw it, it's got that perfect D-shaped exit hole. That's the size of its head. This newly planted tree, I would have said, meh it's probably not planted properly or there might have been something else going on but that tree was so stressed 
it was under attack by two lying chestnut borer. Look at that top part, that canopy's gone, that crown's gone, there's nothing on the top, and there's all that shrubbiness. You know what, take a close examination, get a hand lens, see if you can see that D-shaped exit hole. Two lying chestnut borer can be managed. Uh, um, but it's, it's getting it at the right time and making sure that that tree is not overwhelmed because these trees can handle a little bit of pest pressure. They can't handle a lot. Galls, I love galls. What? I love galls. Oak, apple, gall, and then you've got rough bullet gall over on the upper right-hand side. You've got our gouty oak gall on the lower left, and then you have jumping oak gall on the lower right. The only one I'm really concerned about is gouty oak and horned oak gall. So gouty oak gall actually, you know, it's created by the gouty oak gall wasp, which is handy enough to remember. What happens is the wasp lays their egg in little slits on the branch, and then the, 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 the tree actually responds to it and says, wait a minute, what's that? And so it creates this tissue that starts to grow around and actually protect that egg or that little larva. Gouty oak gall, usually is a two year cycle, but what we're seeing is with gouty oak gall and horned oak gall, that it's actually causing fine twig dieback. So that twig to the right of the gall will actually die over time because it's just being choked off. So it's super important on, on a lot of our young oaks. If you do see these types of galls, I would advocate removing them during the non-growing season. This is what a heavy infestation looks like. That tree, we're never going to get rid of all those galls. And that was just at a forest preserve. It's just everywhere. And why is it everywhere? You know, those wasps really just don't want to move around a lot. And so it stays pretty ice, uh, pretty local. And it can really, truly just, really, truly just take over the whole tree. It's amazing. I took this picture. And what you see is that terminal bud on the end is now dead because of all the little tiny black or the sort of those last year's galls, if you will, and it stunted the growth. And so it, it can cause deformity. We're going to shift gears quickly into our forest pests. And I wanted to, I think I've got an update on a, on a recent find in Virginia. Yep, this just in. We've got the elm zigzag sawfly. Elm zigzag sawfly came from our uh, Oaks in Canada, sadly enough. And if you know our maples aren't stressed and our oaks aren't stressed, now we've got something to worry about with our elms. So you're starting to see this really familiar pattern over on the right-hand side on, um, on the leaf. You do see your, oak, uh, your elms and they look a little rough and tattered. You know, definitely try to get a sample and look at it very closely to see if you can see that zigzag pattern that is a real key identifier. Um, just got a notice about this two days ago, just wanted to let you guys know. Uh, I'm really concerned about our elms right now. Uh, if we get any type of establishment, um, there'll be a lot of information that's shared and certainly uh, Debbie and Trees Forever will be able to, to share that information with you as well. I want to talk a little bit about emerald ash borer. Many people know about it. Some people are like, hey, we just noticed that something's wrong with our ash trees and we have EAB. So it's a wood boring beetle native to China. It feeds exclusively on ash trees. So our green ash, our white ash, our black ash trees, which are really important to uh, you know, our cultural heritage, as well as pumpkin ash, a little bit of feeding, blue ash, not so much. Um, that doesn't mean, you know, if that ash tree is nearby, if a blue ash tree is right next to a green ash tree, believe me, that uh, pest is not going to care whether or not it's green or blue. It doesn't matter. It's the proximity associated with it. So blue ash, you know, sometimes is more common. No, it is definitely more common in our natural areas than in our urban areas. So green ash and white ash are almost exclusively planted in and around parks and, and subdivisions and whatnot. So again, looking at distributions of different trees is trying to determine whether or not there'll be more or less of a population of this pest. Just to show you really, really quickly, you know, the larva, it hangs out. They create those S-shaped larval galleries. Um, the adults emerge, they feed on the leaves, they mate and then they lay their eggs right underneath the bark crevice and they complete their life cycle. 
Emerald ash borer is a lazy, lazy pest. It does not want to move anywhere. Sadly, between here and um, I'll show you in just a minute. See that D-shaped exit hole? So you can see them over on the right-hand side. EAB arrived in Detroit. Uh, it was on an infested shipping pallets. Remember that picture I showed you? Hadn't gone through a phytosanitation process, so it, all of that wood was infected. So it came in, it sat here, and then it began to spread. So this is just a lovely uh, schematic of kind of what happens. It came in on wood pallets, so you see the larva, and then it found its favorite host trees. Um, and this is this image, I didn't put up the other image. This is over probably a three year period that this tree was, these trees were heavily infested. So it's something to be very, very concerned about. If your ash trees look sad, sick, they look like they're being uh, fed upon, the crown looks like it's dying back, you know, definitely get out and look at that bark, make sure you can tell whether or not there is any D-shaped exit holes, if there's any bark that's peeling back and you start to see those S-shaped galleries underneath, a tree needs to be reported, it needs to be evaluated uh, by a trained healthcare uh, technician. There are excellent management plans for ash trees and they have been very effective. You typically need to catch them when the trees are less than 30% infected. So again, that 25 to 30% uh, benchmark. Look at that EAB distribution. So there you see Illinois, and then you see that one dot out in California or Colorado. That was a truckload of firewood that was moved from Illinois to Boulder, Colorado. And that instead of taking over 130 years, it took about a 16 hour car ride to actually move that pest from one infected area to an uninfected area. So again, minimizing the risk of spread and not moving firewood is very important. This is a, a good image. You know, this is three years of heavy feeding. Obviously, there's a lack of tree diversity. So we know now that having a diverse suite of trees is the best defense against some of these pests and pathogens. Just a quick image of the life cycle. So you've got eggs and the larva. You want to start to get that uh, management into, you know, right before the larval state really truly um you know there there's different times and there's different treatments whether it's a trunk injection which is very effective against the larva um soil application soil drench applications i in my mind to be honest with you are not as effective it takes a lot of chemical and it has very little results so if i see a tree and i want to make sure that i am keeping that tree I want to do what it is that I can, and I would recommend going with the trunk injection. Different rates of injection are based on the size of that tree, so it's hard to give a, a general statement. Another, just an image of the larval state, there's the S-shaped galleries. It's very, very, once you see it, you definitely will know exactly what it is. So if you look at the lower right-hand side, seeing all those S-galleries, that means that that tree was almost dead when it was really starting to get uh, heavily infested. The more larval galleries there are, the more likely that that tree was over that you know, tipping point. So if you just see a few larval galleries, few S-shaped larval galleries, that means that that tree is pretty healthy and it might have a fighting chance. Again, the adult stage, smaller than a penny really. So knowing what you uh, what to look for is very helpful. So seeing the signs of it, you know, over on the left hand side, green and healthy, great. The picture, the second picture, that is the key. We usually see that, and that's where we run to and say, you know what, we've got to help that tree. The last of the three images, that tree is checked out. All it has is that epicormic branches on. The Again, I mentioned the woodpeckers, or you're starting to see the blonding uh, when the when the bark on the outside of the tree sloughs off, and you can see the inner bark. It's called blonding, and it's just a, a blonde, uh, like a not even ivory. It's just kind of like a, a light tan color, if you will. But that's also a good indication, a good sign. 
here another image of the S-shaped galleries. Moving on to Gypsy Moth, I think I mentioned this to you. It's a crazy year for Gypsy Moth. I took these images. Kind of cute, but really in a scary sort of way. Uh, this population went unmanaged and unchecked for a number of years, and they have a significant problem. Uh, over on the lower right-hand side, the white uh, moth is a female, and the, black, the brown one is the male. So we want to make sure that if you do see any of these white moths and they are flying around, meaning they're actually leaving the tree and going somewhere else, we want a video, we want to know about it. We need to uh, track and capture a specimen in order to test the DNA to make sure that it is not an Asian gypsy moth, which is uh, much more invasive. We've got lookalikes, Eastern tent caterpillars. So our uh, gypsy moth does not create these tents or these, these tents like the Eastern tent caterpillar or the fall webworm, more importantly. Our white marked tussock. Uh, we're on the upper right hand is our native. Oftentimes people are like, look at that crazy, you know, um, moth, or the caterpillar. And uh, oftentimes we just, we, we get called out, we take a look at it. The egg sac is very similar to it, but a white marked tussock typically is very low on the trunk and it has little tiny black sticks in it. So that's one way you can tell it apart from the, the gypsy moth. I took this picture, there was no ground vegetation left. There was nothing. Look, you can see straight through it. They ate everything. Look at that, that top part of the tree. It's just gone. I mean, it's absolutely amazing to see it and to hear it. There it is, another image where these trees, these trees are stressed right now. I mean, you think about, you know, the increased temperatures on the forest floor, the lack of vegetation, the lack of diversity, and now you've got stress going on and now you've got drought on top of it. So it's these compounding effects that start to really impact the health of our trees. And the caterpillars, the gypsy moth caterpillars, they're feeding on everything. They're feeding on cherry, elm, um, what else is there? I didn't see any maple, uh, hackberry. I mean, they were going crazy on hackberry, which is amazing. And, and then multiflora rose, have at that. Um, and then all sorts of our other ground vegetation. I'm trying to think of, of what else was there to ask for the There wasn't a lot there, so it was hard for me to, to think of it. Uh, chestnut, horse chestnut, definitely feeding heavily on that. So uh, when they're there and they're hungry, they are ferocious. We do surveys, so any type of surveys that we are doing as part of the slow the spread, if there are more than 10 male adults in any of the traps, that is a trigger for that location to be put on a grid and evaluated for treatment. What they're trying to do with the slow the spread program, what you see is that line kind of where the yellow and the green, and then there's two sets of line. The outer line is, I think, the year forecast to 2050. So if we did nothing, that's how that uh, the progression of gypsy moth would spread. The inner line is the management line. It's, we're trying to hold back uh, that population. Very effective uh, using uh, native fun fungus, Entomophaga myamaya. Um, unfortunately, to be honest with you, right now in the drought, that's really knocking back that fungus. So uh, we're going to revisit that next year and try to figure out um, whether or not we can uh, look at using that as a control method. And then aerial applications of BTK have been effective because it's a very target specific application. Asian longhorn beetle, I mentioned this before, I've got about nine minutes, so I'm gonna move swiftly through this, but Asian longhorn beetle was here and it likes everything, a maple, elm, birch, willow, you name it. It's a generalist. We did a really good job in identifying it with an early detection. We wanna make sure that we do that again. So August is tree check month. We want everybody to be like Barry because Barry was the one that reported it to everybody that he could find and it was very effective in the communication and certainly very effective in a rapid response plan for management. 
EAB, it's got that long, beautiful antennae that wrap around the end of the body. It's uh, kind of a bluish white. It's got blue, bluish markings on its legs, and there are uh, scattered white dots on the on the back part of uh, Asian longhorn beetle on the back shell, but there's no markings on that neck, so that thorax, there's no white markings or bandings. This is what we would typically see as one dead and dying branch. Over on the right-hand side, you've got a tree that is kind of, it's got oozing sticky sap, or there's frass. Frass is like that pencil shavings that could be collected either on the bottom or on some of the branch branches. What to watch out for is that wood that if you were to, to uh, remove a branch, if you see any of that corkscrewing that's going on, meaning that that larva is trying to eat its way out and it does it because it sits in the center of the tree and chews its way out. And that's what you see. That is wood that has been really, really utilized. The markings on the outside are where the egg masses are. The markings on the inside is where the larva overwintered and then started to eat its way out. So that wood is really significantly uh, damaged. August is tree check month. If we were together, I'd be able to hand you your own number two pencil. Uh, if you can take a pencil and you can stick it into the hole of a trunk or a branch, you need to have that tree evaluated by a trained professional because that is a sure sign that there is a borer uh, present. And it may not be the Asian longhorn beetle, uh, but definitely uh, there, is, there is cause for concern. This is a potential threat to Illinois. Uh, we know that there have been five dead adults found at the Rockford Airport, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Uh, spotted lanternfly, why do we care? It goes after hops, it goes after grapes, it goes after any of our stone fruits, and it likes Tree of Heaven. And we now know that Tree of Heaven is absolutely everywhere in the state. And so we know it's on the move. We know that you can see how it's actually moving out um, into Ohio, sort of the eastern edge of Pennsylvania, and then into Ohio. Those are not large populations. They're just one occurrence. So if you find one, that county gets lit up. Came through a typical pathway. This was a hardscape, so the egg masses were underneath and they got put out on the lot and forgotten about for a year or two. And you can see in the back in that green, that's all tree of heaven. And so that pest found its perfect host in Berks County, Pennsylvania. So we've been dealing with this for about five, four and a half, five years. There's a really, really good program put in place with the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and uh, the US Department of Agriculture. So they're actively trying to manage the population of spotted lanternfly. Uh, there's a lot of discussion that it would never be eradicated, but only managed. What happens is very similar to a gypsy moth, their egg masses. So if you see those buff cottony egg masses, on the tree, or if you see like a putty color egg mass, you definitely need to take a picture and send it to me, send it to us, and let us take a look at it and make sure we know what it is. So the female takes about 30 minutes, she lays her egg, and then she goes back over it with a waxy coating. How crazy is that? And that's how they overwinter. And that's what they look like, those sausage tracks. It's a challenge to manage because there's many different life stages throughout the year. So August, September, and October are when we should be looking for this pest. It likes to feed on the lenticel so it can use its chewing mouth part and open that up and use that pressure during the spring when the fluids are moving from below ground to above ground. So that's why that why spotted lanternfly likes tree of heaven? Everybody always asks, why tree of heaven? Because it's the easiest and most economical way for them to get food. In Illinois, I mentioned this before, last year we spent time documenting the distribution of tree of heaven and we have 100% positive county records. Rockford is a priority for us. There were tree or planes coming in from the East Coast and there is a fumigation for Japanese beetle, and we believe that that fumigation process actually killed those adults, but it's 
something that we're really concerned about and we will be monitoring pretty heavily in uh, Rockford this summer. Report any sus suspicious paths. Uh, Lanternfy at illinois.edu is what you want to go to. We have great resources, so the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Hungry Pests, uh, has a great, great resources, great activities, uh, great information. Reporting options I mentioned to you, so if you want to do ongoing management and monitoring, using iNaturalist is a really cool application, very helpful. Any data that's collected on trees uh, generally gets used by our research staff as well as myself. So iNaturalist is great. EdsMap is another wonderful resource. So if you're at all interested, please check either one or both of them out. Plant Clinic at Morton Arb, uh, check out our resource. And then find us on Facebook. So Illinois ISAM, so ISAM stands for Invasive Species. It should be Awareness and Management, but it's the same letters. So check us out. Just put in Illinois and then IS, and I think you should find it. It should come up. If you're interested, I have my contact information. So email me. I will be happy to mail you your very own copy of the Management of Invasive Plants and Pests of Illinois. And it has a lot of great information, not only on tree pests, but also invasive. Uh, plants and it has management. It has really good management recommendations. Here is our state and federal partners and then my information as well. So the Department of Agriculture is the first line of defense. Uh, USDA APHIS, Greg Rensler is our state plant health director. He's also a good contact for information and then my contact information. And then that's it. We have one minute. <laughs> like, oh no. Uh, that is it. You can help. Don't move firewood. That's the number one thing that we can do. I am going to quickly uh, stop my screen share and then show my video. And Debbie, are you there? Yep. Yep. We have a couple questions. Um, actually, we have more than a couple, but we're, we'll uh, go through uh, just a couple of them if if everyone can hang on. I know uh, it's right at one o'clock, so we want to be cognizant of your time. Is herbicide damage typical next to just next to agricultural fields, or is it something that you're seeing in in towns in the city as well? Uh, next to golf courses or parks. Any, anywhere where there is a large area to manage for invasive species. So oftentimes with golf courses, they'll go in and apply an herbicide or insecticide. And sometimes, you know, to be honest with you, it's not necessarily the fault of the applicator. It could be that the wind picks up. And once that wind picks up or say, come, you know, we, we get a real hot blast, that pesticide or the uh, pesticide can actually herbicide, it can actually volatize and it can move up into the atmosphere and then move out in areas that would be unintended. Okay, is Kermi scale a fungus or is it an actual insect? That's it's an actual insect. It's an insect. It's one of our soft scale insects. Microscopic. You can't even see it. I mean, we only knew about it because we saw all of the leaf drop. Okay. Um, Todd asks, uh, due to the derecho last year, they had to trim deadwood and hangers in their oak trees in early June. Is there anything he can do to help protect the oaks from oak wilt or other possible issues? Yeah, one of the things, if you have to prune an oak during the growing season, you need to seal it right away. And, and that's, the, that's the biggest thing that you could possibly do for that. So, you know, right now, you know, watching that tree is really super important. Um, is there anything you can do to prevent the spread of oak wilt? Not pruning during the growing season, or if you had to prune, prune and seal within 30 minutes. And, and people would say, you should just prune and then spray. So if I had to do it, I would probably get just like a clear acrylic and then seal that. The jury's still out as to whether or not it needs to be resealed 
But one of the things you can do is look at where those, um, those pruning cuts are and see if there's any sap. If you see any sap or you see any beetles, you know, trying to scrape off that sap um, and then try to seal it up, it's as bad, that, that would be what we would recommend. Okay. How damaging are cedar, cedar apple galls? Are they worth removing? Uh, no, I don't think that they're worth removing. The rough bullet galls, which are ones that I see, they're not damaging so much, but it's the amount that actually start to increase and spread all over the trees. So me personally, if I've got a young oak that I planted and I start to see these galls, once you see that exit hole, hole on that gall, I just, I just literally just pick it off. Just pick it off, throw it on the ground, and let it be another home for another insect. But just keeping it off of that tree so it doesn't girdle the twigs. Okay. And one more question. Um, anything on brown marmorated stink bugs? No, other than it's just the biggest pest. <laughs> There is a national program, you know, to be honest with you, to try to figure out what to do with brown marmorated stink bug. It is really hard to manage the pathway, and that's why you haven't seen more regulation or more activities associated with it. Um, from a homeowner's perspective, just making sure that you keep your cracks and crevices in your house all sealed up. Typically, we're starting to see brown marmorated stink bug is when there's a lot of plant material. And so they like to feed on that plant material and then they like to move into you know, that warm side of the building and overwinter. So um, making sure that you have good hygiene in both areas is really important. Okay, one just came in. Can I prune dead oak wood during the growing season without sealing the cut or should I wait till the dormant season? I wait till the dormant season. I'm just gonna be really strict and specific about that. We don't prune oaks during the growing season. Unless, unless that oak tree is like hanging over your house or you know, an, an area where it could do potential damage to, to humans and animals and whatnot. Um, but for the most part, even though it's dead and dying, I wouldn't risk it. All right. And we just have a reminder um, from Jean Marie that everybody should be watering their trees, particularly in the drought. Um, you should make sure your, your trees get watered the equivalent of an inch per week. So that could be five, five to 10 gallons for a small tree. That could be 20 to 30 gallons for a larger tree. Particularly yeah. during the hot dry periods, you want to water more frequently, maybe every three or four days instead of just once a week. But make sure you're watering your trees, including your large mature trees. They still need the water as well not just the young new ones. Yeah, and that, so, that's great advice, yep. So thank you, Tricia, for joining us today. Um, again, people, we thank you for joining us on this webinar. Um, we're glad you could, you could join us. Uh, we ran a few minutes over for questions, but there was a lot of great information today. So thank you very much for joining us today. This will be, um, it has been recorded and it will be up on our Trees Forever webinars page in the archive section. If you want to watch it again or want to share it with others, you're more than welcome to do that. With that, thank you very much and have a great rest of your day. Great. Thanks, Debbie, and thanks, everyone. Take care.